All right, so for humorous, um, I find humorous similar to femur in that there's not a ton to it. Uh, you're going to do an AP and lateral, obviously, 90 degrees from each other. What's demonstrated in the AP, you're going to see the greater tubercle and epicondyles are parallel. What do you see in the lateral? You're going to see lesser tubercles, epicondyles are perpendicular. When would you use a transthoracic humerus? Fracture of the upper third of the humerus. Um, you'd use probably a breathing technique to do that. Uh, shoulder, non-trauma. What are you looking at? AP internal, you're going to see the lesser. External, greater. Um, so trauma situation, grashy, glenoid. So the grashy view here, you want to see the glenoid space. I just remember GG. Remember, it's less of an oblique than the Y view. So it's only 30 to 45 degrees oblique uh, toward the image receptor. Y view is a bigger, is a steeper oblique, 45 to 60. If you did a Y view PA, it would reduce the breast tissue dose. It would also reduce OID. Um, it might give you better spatial resolution, but realistically, when you have a trauma situation where the patient is dislocated, how are you most often doing them? Most often they're AP in a stretcher if it's your trauma situation. But you're not gonna turn that patient on their stomach. Um, so just looking at some of the benefits that way. Why do we do a Y view? What are we looking for? Dislocation, right? Anterior or posterior dislocation. The inferior superior or axillary method, right? The beam is coming from the inferior exiting the superior. Uh, Lawrence method, looking for your axillary shoulder. Coracoid versus coronoid. Can you quickly know where the coracoid is? I remember it as someone told me, a crow sits on your shoulder. So the C sits on your shoulder because the coracoid with a C is here. There's a noid in the mandible and a noid in the elbow. Um, so coracoid, crow sits on your shoulder. Someone else told me that there is a C in between two islands. Um, so the two ends and then there's a C in the middle. That was a little confusing for me. The crow sits on the shoulder, works for me. Helps me memorize it. Or you just simply memorize the terms because you're smarter than me. Scapula. AP and lateral, right? AP, you want to bring the arm out, right angle to the chest. Elbow flex, they can rest their arm on their forehead. You're centering a little bit inferior than uh, shoulder. So two inches inferior to the coracoid with a C, right? You may use a breathing technique. Most often we don't, but possible. The lateral is your Y view shoulder position. What's the variation? You bring the humerus away. So you're reaching your to the other side of the body, draw that arm away. You wanna see a chromion and coracoid. You wanna see this nice Y picture here and a lateral view of the scapula. Oop, skip the page. Um, clavicle and EC joints. Clavicle, AP axial clavicle is a kind of a big range. It's at 15 to 30 degree cephalad angle. It's going to demonstrate the clavicle above the lung field and the rib cage. If your patient were PA for some reason for clavicle, what would you adjust? Right? It's always opposite. If there's a variant, it's opposite. So instead of angling 15 up, you're going to angle 15 down. What are some of the benefits of doing a PA clavicle? Less OID. Reduce magnification, reduce thyroid dose. So it could be a radiation safety related question. Right. AC joints. Uh, what are some buzzwords on AC joints? You're going to do them with or without weights. Uh, ideally, the weights are affixed to their wrists and they drag their shoulders down. You want to do bilateral. You want the patient to be erect. The method name is Pearson. Uh, An ideal is the 72 inch SIDY because the OID between the actual AC joints and the wall bucky. The other section can include bone age, which is um, that left hand and wrist or non-dominant side. Uh, most places use the left side only. Non-dominant side can also be used as well. 
um, and I will butcher the name if I say the name. I think it's Grillic and Pile Method. They discovered it and did the research for it, so it's named after them, but the bone age will be on a pediatric patient, um, most often for, you know, advanced puberty or not quite at the growth that they want to be at. The radiologist will measure them and determine where they are sort of on a range of where they should be for their age group. And then bone surveys. Adult bone surveys are um, most often for metastatic cancer. We're looking for cancer that has traveled into other parts of the body. We're going to do APs and laterals, maybe of extremities. It's going to include chest, skulls, pelvis. Can you pick out metastatic cancer? If you were shown this image, would be able to pick out what it is. Um, can you remember if metastatic cancer is an additive or destructive disease? Some sort of questions. And then bone surveys on pediatric patients, when would those be used? Those are usually used for the abuse surveys or NAT for non-accidental trauma. And do I have another page? Oh, last page. I think I talked about this already in the beginning, but I'm going to reiterate it again. Don't be afraid during your test to imagine the patient in front of you. If it's giving you a descriptive question and it's describing how a patient is positioned, try to picture yourself doing that at clinical with a patient in front of you. You're doing it textbook, not a random clinical way, right? So if they are describing a patient position, a patient's recumbent, their right side is rotated towards the table bucky. In your head, you should be saying, okay, my patient's in a posterior oblique. What am I seeing? And if it's asking you about a lumbar spine where the patient's in a right posterior oblique, are you seeing side closest? Are you seeing side farthest? Is an SI joint question. Is it side away? Is it side closest? Something like that. And then when the picture comes up on the screen, you'll know it. You guys know all these views. You've done almost all of these exposures, except for maybe some of the random ones, but you should be able to figure those out because you know your anatomy. And I'm going to just reiterate my tips here too. Slow down. Read the question twice. Read it once, straight through. Stop yourself. Go back, read every word in that sentence. Don't assume you know what the question is asking you because you've seen something like it in your practice. There is always keywords in the question, and usually those keywords lead you to that answer. All right. Um, read all the answers. Don't just click that first answer you see, because it might be correct, but it might not be the best answer. So watch for that. Go with your gut. Always go with your gut. Go with your first answer. Don't change it. Unless you're absolutely 100% sure that it's wrong. I really, I hate when my students change their answer because they usually get it wrong because they changed it. Leave it alone. Answer it. Move on. Don't mull over it. If you're concerned, write it on your whiteboard to go over later and check back at the end. But don't let it ruin your focus on the next series of questions. Don't watch the clock. You're going to have more than enough time. You'll be perfectly fine. All right, that rounds out procedures.